Well, last time we <clears throat> again saw the Jews bringing charges against Paul through a Roman lawyer by the name of Tertullus. And remember, Tertullus started by trying to sway the governor's judgment through flattery. But then he laid three charges uh, at Paul's feet. He charged him with three crimes. That, he created disturbances among the Jews wherever he went throughout the empire. That he was the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And that he had desecrated the temple. Now, in his defense, Paul argued this, that with regard to creating disturbances among the Jews, he says, look, I've been in Jerusalem now for many days, and they haven't found me anywhere, neither in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city, even speaking with anyone. If, if I'm the one who's creating disturbances wherever I go, why isn't that true here? Uh, not guilty. As far as promoting the way of Jesus the Nazarene, as the one who has fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets, which the Jews themselves also respect and cherish, that is, the law and the prophets, he pled guilty. But that was not illegal. Again, uh, he was innocent. And as to desecrating the temple, when they found him, he was really honoring the traditions. I mean, he was in the temple, having gone through the ceremonial purification rites in order that he might present offerings to his Lord. And remember, he was doing that to show the Jews that he had not forsaken the traditions of Moses. So Paul says, I'm innocent of having broken any law, either of the Jew or the Romans. But remember, Felix, instead of releasing him, unjustly decided to keep him in custody for fear of the Jews, because they were already angry with him over his treatment of uh, their nation. Remember how he was basically profiting from these worthless men who were robbing from the Jews, and he was taking his cut. And likewise, at the same time, he was hoping that Paul would use some of the alms that he had brought in, in which to help his people to pay for his release. Remember, Paul originally came there uh, in order to bring the gifts that were given by the churches to help the poor saints in Jerusalem. Felix thought maybe he could benefit from that. Now, we read at the end of the last chapter that he had actually held Paul for another two years. Let me just remind you, you know, Paul was, was not basically living for his own comfort. He was willing to put up with, with all these things that happened. And again, there were a lot of things. Look at Second Corinthians again, the catalog of things he suffered for the gospel. And the fact that he was willing to sit for two years in Caesarea in this jail, in this prison, for the glory of Christ. There wasn't anything that Paul would not do for the kingdom of heaven. But during this time, Paul also bought up every opportunity that he had to share the gospel with Felix, even with this wicked official. Now, why would he do that, right? Well, it reminds us that you really can't tell by looking at someone whether or not the Lord intends to call them by His Holy Spirit. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that we are to share the gospel with everyone. You know, sometimes I think we tend to focus on those people we think might believe, you know, or maybe can be convinced, or especially those people we really want to see come to faith in Christ, the ones we really care about. But we're not supposed to focus just on them. We're supposed to also focus on people we, have, we think there's really no chance they could come to Christ because the likelihood that either are going to come is the same. It's ultimately in the Lord's hands, isn't it? So Paul buys up these opportunities. We need to do the same. And then one final thing we noted last time was Paul constantly bringing up in his message the resurrection and final judgment. He did so at his trial before the Sanhedrin. Remember, that's what divided the uh, Pharisees from the Sadducees. He did it before Felix and the Jews. Again, this is why I'm on trial for the resurrection. He did it when he talked to Felix in private. And we saw that he did it on other occasions as well. He believed it was important to warn his hearers of the danger that they were in. That one day they were going to have to give an account before God even of every idle word that they spoke. And they needed to know that so that they would see their need for a Savior. And that's again why we need to share this truth also with others. I mean, why did we come to Christ in the first place? It wasn't only because we loved Him, because we didn't love Him until the Lord first worked His grace in our lives, but it was because we saw our need of Him 
because we knew we were sinners, because we knew we were on our way to judgment. That's, again, why law often comes before gospel, why John the Baptist comes before Jesus, preaching the law and repentance is to show us our need of Christ and certainly the fact that we're going to stand before Him on that day gives us every reason to be afraid. But the only way that fear can be dealt with is by trusting in Jesus, and that's the reason why we speak of that judgment and why Paul did. Now, this morning we're going to begin to look at two final encounters that Paul has before he boards the, the ship for Rome. The first before Festus and the Jews, and the second before Festus and King Agrippa. And as I've already mentioned, since the second half of chapter 25 basically deals with review uh, of this first interview with Festus as he's preparing Agrippa to hear Paul, I basically would like to cover this, this whole chapter this morning. Now, the first thing we see are the Jews again attacking Paul. After Festus arrived in, in Caesarea uh, to succeed Felix, he went up to Jerusalem. Okay. Immediately, the chief priests and the elders brought charges against Paul. Now, again, this shows us that over the last two years, that that, that time had not taken the edge off of their hatred. They still saw Paul as a threat. They saw him as the driving force behind the way, behind the Nazarenes. They knew how effective he was in promoting what they considered to be this heresy. And so they continue to despise him for this. Now, you know, I, I, as I thought about that, I, I thought, you know, how many of us would really like to be in Paul's position? To be so hated, to be so despised by this religious group of people. Well, you know, when you think about it, wouldn't it be wonderful if by God's grace, the enemies of the gospel saw us as this kind of threat against them because we were so zealous in promoting God's kingdom. This is really what we should desire. You know, Paul, when he, again, thought about all the, the bruises, the bumps, all the scars, all the broken bones, all the things that he had suffered, all the times in prison and shipwrecked and going in want and all of these things, he didn't say, why did I do this? I mean, look at, look at how the Lord's repaying me. But he said, I glory in these scars because they were meant for Christ and I took them in his place and that, that basically Christ shone strongly enough through me that people would recognize him and hate me for it. That was a great honor. He saw that as a great honor. And that's something we shouldn't try to avoid, but something really we should glory in if we should suffer for his sake. But because of their hatred, they urged Festus to bring him to Jerusalem, again under the pretense of putting him on trial while they secretly plotted to kill him on the way. And this is the same tactic we saw last time with those 40 plus Jews, actually it was a couple weeks ago, took that vow in order to kill him. Well, Festus said he was keeping Paul at Caesarea. That's where he should be kept because he was a prisoner of Rome. And that if they wanted to bring charges, they should send some men along with him in order to do so there. Now, Festus knew from Felix and undoubtedly from Lysias, the tribune's report, that Paul was a Roman citizen. And so he took his duty to protect him very seriously. And again, here's, here's a place where we need to kind of step back and look. I mean, who is Festus? Who is Felix? Who is Lysias? They're all officials of a Roman government, a wicked government. But we see here that even ungodly governments can do what God established them to do. Okay? They can protect the innocent. Paul writes again in Romans 13, verses 3 through 4, which we read in our meditation, Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. Now again, remember that Paul was innocent, and so he was not afraid of the Romans. You know, if, you, if you're in trouble with the government because, because you've done something that's illegal, well, then you should be concerned. But in this case, Paul had already cleared himself. He was innocent, so he really was not afraid. Now, a few days later, Festus went to Caesarea, and the next day he sat on his judgment seat and ordered Paul to be brought. 
When Paul arrived, the Jews were ready with their charges against him. Luke doesn't tell us this time what these charges were, except that, again, they were not able to make these charges stick. Now, again, think about the situation between the Jews and between Paul. As I was thinking about it, I thought this, this seems similar to what was going on in the 16th century between Luther and, and the church of his day. Remember that both Luther and the church leaders all basically held to the same standard, at least they said they did, the Word of God. However, the church in that day had, all, had added some additional things, but they both basically had their allegiance to one standard, and yet they could not come to agreement over what that standard said. And so hatred began to mount. The church hated Luther and wanted to kill him. Now, that's exactly what was happening with Paul, wasn't it? The Jewish leaders who thought they knew the Old Testament law and prophets, they hated Paul because they thought he was going against what these things actually said. Now, this hatred, as I've already mentioned, can occur if you take a stand for the truth. Even those within the church are not going to love you for it. And sadly, churches disagree on a number of things. We just need to make sure that when we stand for the truth... And when we suffer repercussions for it, if we happen to be hated by somebody for it, that we need to do what Paul does in this situation. Okay, Paul did not return evil for evil. Paul did not hate the Jews for their persecution of him, but rather he continued to love him, even as we are called to love our enemies and continue to try to win them to Jesus Christ, even if they disagree with us on serious matters. Now, secondly, we see Paul's defense and his appeal to Caesar. Again, in the face of these charges, Paul asserts his innocence, that he had broken neither the Jewish law, the temple law, nor the Roman law. Now, Festus, though he was perhaps a more just judge than Felix, wanted to gain some political capital in the eyes of the Jews. I mean, that's, that's how politics works. I think we know that from our own uh, current situation. But he knew that he could not do this without Paul's consent because Paul had the rights of a Roman citizen. So he asked Paul if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem to stand trial on these charges, the very thing, that, of course, that the Jewish priests and the elders had asked earlier. Well, Paul then, perhaps because he thought Festus was going to grant this to the Jews, or because he saw through this and saw it as another plot of the Jews to ambush him, I'm, I'm thinking Paul probably did, or because he knew that this was the way that God was going to bring him to Rome to bear witness to the gospel there, said this, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of these things or of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. By the way, he seems to be looking at this as if I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. Okay, I, don't, I, don't, um, I don't refuse to die if I've done something worthy of death. But it would be unjust of you to hand me over to them to put me to death if I have actually done nothing that is wrong. What he does is he wraps himself again in the protection to which his citizenship entitled him. And again, remember, this is the reason God ordained government. Now, this appeal guaranteed that he would stand before Caesar. And though the particular Caesar in power at this time was Nero, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most wicked men who has ever lived on the face of the earth as R.C. is going to remind us in our evening series, maybe not so much tonight, but as he deals with the beast and the Antichrist, okay, that he, this is the Caesar who would shortly set fire to Rome and then blame the fire on the Christians, instigating persecution against the, the church, even though all these things are true. Paul appears to have had every hope that Nero was going to clear him. Okay, again, trusting that... Government would work the way God had intended it, 
And I think he could have this confidence at this particular time because Nero had not yet set Rome on fire. He had not yet persecuted the Christians. And at this time, Christianity was still legal. And so it was a protected religion. Basically, the Romans saw it as a part of Judaism. So again, Paul appeals to him in order to be kept safe from what he saw clearly as a plot of the Jews to kill him. Now, before we move on, I just wanted to note one other thing that Paul says here that, that I think is true and that our society today seems to have completely lost sight of, and that is that capital punishment for capital crimes is actually a just thing, and it is something that God desires. He said, if I've committed you know, crimes worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. Because I know that that is what the Lord requires. Remember what God said in Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. It's a very serious crime to murder or to destroy God's image. Serious enough to warrant the death of the one who actually commits this crime. By the way, the Bible does talk about other crimes that deserve death as well. And even though our culture recoils at the idea of executing someone for any reason, okay, if our government actually enacted this penalty for the crimes that God says are actually worthy of this penalty, I think we'd see a, a lot fewer of these crimes being committed. You know, maybe fewer people taking up guns, going into schools and just murdering people at will because they would know that their life would be forfeit as soon as they took a life. As a matter of fact, even if they tried or conspired to do so, their life would be forfeit. Well, Paul, having appealed to Caesar, Festus confers with his counsel and decides, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. And again, we see God's plan unfolding through all these different circumstances. Realizing that God ordinarily, even in these days, did not work directly and supernaturally, miraculously in every situation, but he worked through the situations, the circumstances of the lives of his people to fulfill his purposes. You know, we were discussing the book of Genesis not too long ago and thinking about Joseph's life and God's will was, you know, through his dreams when he was a young man that he actually end up in Egypt in order to save his family from the famine. But how does he get there? God doesn't transport him miraculously from where he was into Egypt, you know. And he doesn't just go to Pharaoh and tell him, I want you to take Joseph and make your second in command. But instead, he allows the hatred of his brothers to sell him as a slave into Egypt and then the the temptation of Potiphar's wife to end him up in prison and then the interpretation of the two men who are also in prison who eventually bring it to Pharaoh's attention when God gives him a dream and through all of these things brings him to this you know, second command and in Egypt how he works through providential circumstances to carry out his will. And again, this reminds us that you know, I, I know we perhaps often see God bringing his kingdom as the answer to our prayers and the outpouring of His Holy Spirit and suddenly and supernaturally the world is going to come to Christ. But that's not the way it happens. It happens through means. It happens through the Lord using us. That's the reason why He leaves us in this world is because He wants us putting the kingdom first to pray and to give and to evangelize and to move the kingdom forward. That, that's the only way it moves forward is through the efforts of his people. And that's, again, what the Lord calls us to do. That's the process by which he's going to bring this, not ruling out supernatural outpourings of the Holy Spirit, because we have seen those in history, and we ought to pray for those things if the Lord is willing to bring them. Certainly, Jonathan Edwards and those in his day, as they saw the Great Awakening, continued to pray that God would bring even greater revivals. He is capable, and that's something that we ought to be seeking him for. Now, finally, we see Festus meet with King Agrippa to discuss Paul's case. Several days later, King Agrippa arrived in Caesarea with his sister Bernice and went to greet Festus. Now, this man, Agrippa, is Herod Agrippa II. 
the son of Herod Agrippa I. And Herod Agrippa I, we know very well, is the one who basically had uh, James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he took Peter and was going to also execute him. But he was released, remember, by the angel. And this uh, Herod Agrippa I was the one who was also judged by the Lord when he made that great speech and everybody said, you know, cried out the voice of a God and not of a man. And the Lord struck him in judgment because he didn't give him glory. And he was eaten by worms. He was eaten by worms and died. Okay, so Agrippa II is the son of this Agrippa. Now, Agrippa II was also the great-grandson of Herod the Great. He's the Herod who rebuilt the temple. Remember the Herodian stones that uh, R.C. Sproul was telling us about? They were called Herodian stones because Herod the Great was the one who built the Jewish temple. And Herod the Great was also the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was born. So basically, Agrippa II comes from a long line of wicked men. <laughs> And he was also a wicked man himself, an immoral king like his father's. He had entered into an incestuous relationship with Bernice. I mean, Bernice was really not his wife. Bernice was the oldest daughter of his father, Agrippa I, and his sister. Bernice had been by this time widowed twice. And even though he had entered into this scandalous relationship with her, he frequently presented her as queen on official occasions. So basically, this man was living with his sister as his wife. Now, Festus, putting all that aside, because we're talking about Roman officials, right, saw this as an opportunity to place Paul's case before him. And why? Well, it's because Agrippa had recently been favored by Nero. Okay, Nero, again, the Caesar in power at that time, with more influence in northern Palestine, so his council would carry weight with the emperor. Festus, as we also read at the end of this chapter, was also at a loss as to what charges he should send. What was it exactly that Paul was appealing? He wasn't expecting what his accusers had brought. Remember, they thought maybe they, that he thought maybe they would accuse him with civil disobedience or perhaps insurrection. But instead, they simply disagreed over certain points in their religion. They had a disagreement about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. One, one commentator writes this, to refer a Roman citizen's case to the emperor rather than resolving it locally entails some political jeopardy for a provincial governor, particularly if he cannot articulate alleged crimes against the empire that warrant further legal process rather than the prisoner's exoneration and release. So if Festus sends Paul to Rome on appeal and Paul has not really committed any crimes against Rome, well, this is going to look bad on him. So he wants to kind of get Agrippa to agree with him or at least tell him what to do in a case like this. He wants to make sure that he's done his due diligence and that he wasn't sabotaging his own political career before he forwards Paul's appeal to Rome. But I want you to notice something about Festus. Unlike Felix, who was very familiar with the Jewish religion and that of the Nazarenes, okay, Festus seemed to, to know really little or nothing about this whole matter as he was listening to the Jews and Paul argue their case. To him, it sounded like minor disagreements. The most serious disagreement being whether Jesus, this man Jesus they're talking about, was alive or dead. So think about this for a minute. Somebody who's completely uninitiated, I think sometimes we forget just how strange the gospel can sound to people who really know nothing about the issues. You know how it is when you know very little about something and maybe there's two people or groups within this you know, this whole field that have this disagreement, if you don't know very much about it, it seems like there's really not that much difference between them. Uh, that's the way it seemed to, to Festus. Now, when Paul evangelized the Jews, remember, he could assume a great deal of scriptural knowledge. And so he argues from the scriptures. It wasn't too long ago in our culture we could assume the same thing because a lot of people went to church, you know, we had a Christianized society 
And when we think about some of the things that Charles Spurgeon said, and I think back about how I was thinking about his representation of the lion in the cage, remember that? Where he says, don't argue about the gospel, don't try to prove the gospel, uh, basically just speak the gospel. It's like this lion in the cage. Don't, don't just tell people how dangerous the lion is, you know, and what the lion is capable of doing. Just open the door and let the lion out. And they'll see pretty quickly what the lion is able to do. You won't have to prove it. Well, the thing is, in Spurgeon's day, there was a great deal more understanding of the, of the Bible and the truth. They were still hearing it in churches, and most people were in churches in those days. Even though they weren't hearing the exact truth, they still had a lot of background knowledge. Well, we can't do that today. We can't assume this background knowledge. We can't approach people the way that Jesus approached them or the way that Paul did the Jews. Remember, they, they were ministering Jesus primarily to the Jews and Paul to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. What we need to do is look at the examples of how Paul communicated with the Gentiles. Okay? Basically, when Festus saw Paul and the Jews arguing, he did not comprehend what was going on. And if Paul was speaking with him, he would go about it a little bit differently. Okay? Those that don't have this background knowledge, we need to give them some of that knowledge. Remember how Paul approached those on Mars Hill? We looked at that as sort of the great example of, of how to approach basically unbelievers who, who don't know anything about Christianity. He first appealed to their religious nature, which they had because they were made in the image of God. Then to the evidence that God gave of himself in nature, how he had made all things, was in control of what he had made, how being the God of creation, he is infinite, and how being infinite, he is independent. He doesn't need to be served by us. We need Him to provide for us. How He gives to us everything that we have. How He made from one man all the nations on earth from Adam and determined their times and places so that they might seek after Him and find Him. How He is not like idols, you know, made by men's hands of wood and stone, but an infinite spirit in whom we all live and move and have our being. That we are accountable to Him. And that one day he will judge us, and he has proven that he will, by raising Jesus from the dead. See, now that is what Paul said to those who didn't have this background. Now, maybe as you've driven around town, perhaps you've seen those billboards, and maybe you've seen those signs at bus stops, right, the benches, that say, Jesus saves. Call on him now. Well, how effective do you think these signs actually are on those who know little or nothing about the Christian faith? If they even actually even see these signs, they're probably wondering, who's Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus saves. What, what is it that he saves from? Um, what does it mean to call upon him? Uh, these are things that people do not naturally know. You know, they're not revealed in general revelation. We need to bring them this information. Now, that's why R.C. believed that we need to use apologetics, why we need to be able to give a reasoned defense for the gospel, why we need to be able to point to the evidence that God has given that He exists, the evidence that Paul says leaves all men without excuse. I mean, they actually already are without excuse, but because there are so many people today, unbelievers, sophisticated unbelievers who have built and mounted arguments against what we see in the creation, people need to have that information torn away again and refuted, and they need to be brought face to face with the fact that God exists through the creation. We need to be able to give a reasoned defense that the Bible is a communication from God to mankind, and we need to be able to tell them what it says about our danger. There's a coming judgment, and how we can escape it. You have to trust in Jesus Christ and explain what that means. You see, if we don't do that, and if we just simply let the lion out of the cage the way that um, Spurgeon suggested, and by the way, in Spurgeon's day, I believe you could do that. And there are some people we might be able to do that with today, but I don't think we can do it with the majority of people. If we don't do this with the people we share with, they are going to come away like Festus, wondering what all the 
scuffles about? You know, what, what's the issue? Not understanding the point. Maybe even thinking we're crazy. Okay? And people are going to think you're crazy. One of the methods of evangelism that I was taught in another church, thankfully not a Reformed church, was to say something to somebody like, like this when you meet them. Hey, watch me very closely. I might disappear at any moment. Or do you realize who you're speaking to? I'm a child of the king. Okay, now things like that <laughs> are not going to get you very far. Sadly, I did try it on one occasion. The guy I said it to thought it was nuts. Okay, but I knew I wasn't nuts. But how could I prove that to him, right? This isn't just a fantasy that we're believing. It is reality. Well, I think we have to go through, again, that argumentation that uh, R.C. is suggesting. It's not the only way we can go about it, but I think we need to use a method like this, and we are, again, looking at different methods, but we need to be able to defend this faith so that we don't give people an excuse not to believe by making them think that we are nuts, okay? This is reasonable, it's, it's, dare I say, rational? I think I could say that. But irrefutable. It is irrefutable. These things are true, but people need to be able to see it. They need information in the same way that we did. So again, let's, through this example, be encouraged to learn as much as we possibly can, that we might help others find salvation in the Lord Jesus well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do this.